the new introduction to it about the potential dangers that are out there in a region that somehow gets overlooked even when people are paying attention uh, because of a lot of other things that are going on in the world. Today is no exception. One can think about developments in Iran, Turkey, and Russia to, to sort of say, you know, maybe this, this doesn't rise to the top. But uh, two days ago, I think, uh, Olan, Putin, and Obama uh, issued a statement. Um, and I uh, must say, Justin, some of the words sounded vaguely familiar to me. <laughs> um, Bradkey maybe wrote some of them at one point, but uh, the um, you know it, it's part of the challenge of, of NK that there there really isn't much more after 20 years that you can say when you have to go back to the basic and fundamental point that there really hasn't been much change. Uh, and you know I think uh, one one key line. Uh, Tom, is that local resistance against change remains stronger than international pressure to make the peace agreement. I think that's kind of the basic, uh, the basic tension. Um, you can go around and make other comparisons. Uh, Wayne Mary reminds me of Cyprus. Uh, I think about the Balkans because after I got my basic training in Azerbaijan, I did two years in Bosnia as ambassador. So, um, you know, there, there, there really are a lot of similarities, I think. And, in terms of the unresolved nature of the, uh, the, the conflict between peoples, uh, the lack of tolerance, and, and the problem of how do you, as an international community, help move those, those things ahead. But you know, if you look at Tom's book, and there, you know, there are now are other books that have talked about this, this period of history and, and, and this region. But I think what sets this book off is that it's about real people. And I think as diplomats, sometimes we forget that these conflicts are not about dots on a map, boundaries, foreign ministers talking to foreign ministers, but real people whose lives have, have been <coughs> altered forever uh, because of the conflict that took place in, in this region. So I, you know, maybe to start, it would be good, Tom, if you could, you could just sort of try to grapple with the question of why the local resistance has, has been so strong and, and this, this imbalance between that and the international pressure and how that dynamic might, might change. Well, thanks, Rich, and it's also great to see such a, a, a turnout here today. Um, and it's true that, and this is not a, in a sense, not an anniversary to be celebrated, but 10 years ago in, in DC, um, we launched the, the first uh, edition of this book, and it was the first time actually I met uh, rich caused the rich. Um, and there, there were already, I think, the di dynamic was in, in place there, um, that um, this was a conflict in which there were some local vested interests. Um, people were afraid to do a deal with the other side um, for some quite legitimate reasons. They were worried about the, the political cost it would make, worried about you know, crossing that line um, of making peace with the enemy. And that there was international interest um, international diplomatic interest um, in resolving this conflict um, and some quite serious diplomatic interest. But it wasn't on the level that we would find, for example, um, in, in the Balkans. It was, it's always been a kind of a good second order priority for the international community, but never a first order priority for some quite good objective uh, reasons. Um, and I think 10 years on, looking back, I see that that kind of dynamic has, has increased. The positions have hardened. I think most conflicts, probably the best moment uh, to solve them is when the fighting is still pretty fresh on the battlefield. That's what was going on in Bosnia, for example. Um, the, longer, the longer a conflict um, is unresolved, the more positions harden, the more people get used to the status quo, the more people become comfortable with, with something which is not a great situation, but, but they get used to it. Um, and now, unfortunately, I think Karabakh in the last 10 years has entered that phase. It's entered um, that kind of Cyprus phrase of, of a kind of protracted, intractable uh, conflict where it's quite hard to predict a resolution, although obviously efforts continue. But of course, as you hinted at the beginning, it's not Cyprus because there's, there's an inherent instability about this conflict uh, which is not present in Cyprus. Um, Azerbaijan has lost uh, territory which it will, um, and even leaving aside the issue of Karabakh itself, has lost territory which it will never, um, you know, surrender. Um, you know, um, the, 
territories around Karabakh. And also in the last 10 years, the other big story has been the rise of Azerbaijan as a much stronger power uh, than the very weak, disoriented power that lost um, the conflict in the 90s. So there's a, there's a kind of dynamic there to break the status quo. And unfortunately, um, what we fear is that the status quo will be broken in, in favor of war rather than peace. I, I think we're, not, we're certainly not there yet, and I don't want to be alarmist, but, but that would be the trend. This kind of slow trend line is more in that direction than, than it certainly is towards a peace agreement. The, you know, the other feature of this uh, situation that you described, and I, I think you, uh, you've got this nice little piece in the book about the, the schizophrenia that you felt that you'd spend you know, some time in, in Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, and after a while you'd, you, know, you'd, you could sort of understand what was, what was going on, but you had this sense of a lack of trust and an insecurity. Uh, and again, that was the same thing that I, I saw in the Balkans. I mean, we, we, there, you know, we had an international force of some 60, 70,000 troops on the ground, and $5 billion of assistance over a five-year period, and, you know, presidents of the United States, uh, you know, coming to, to, uh, to Bosnia. Um, that hasn't been the case, case here. And it, it's, you know, it's this really this question of how do you overcome the lack of trust and the insecurity. And I would add to that a, a lack of tolerance, which maybe 20 years ago would have been uh, possible. But, but now, as you say, the longer, the longer time passes, there's less of a view of the other except as an enemy. One, one little story from my Balkan experience. I, you know, I'm one of these people who really believes in you know, young folks as the hope of the future. And I went to a university in Banja Luka, which was the third part of, uh, of Bosnia. Uh, and I talked to them about the Dayton Peace Accords and the importance of tolerance. And all they could talk about was going back to war. And these are people you know, in their 20s. And it's, it's how, do you, how do you get out of that mindset, not just the people who were actually directly involved in the prosecution of the conflict, but internally to get us a, a sense of, t you know, if not trust and security, at least tolerance of, of the other to, to be able to develop and move ahead. Well, I mean, that's certainly my, my experience. Obviously, I, um, I first visited Azerbaijan in, in 95, first visited Karabakh in 96. And that's really how I ended up writing the book, because I was just struck by that there were these two parallel realities. It was like going from one closed room into another closed room. And when you're in that closed room, you start to kind of breathe the air. You start to breathe the air that they leave. And, and you start to, to view the conflict in the, in, through their eyes. And then you go back into the other room, and you, and you see it differently. And, I, and um, first of all, I was looking for a book which would explain to me what really happened here, why. And of course, you know, neither side um, could be right, but both could be wrong. Um, in, in their narratives, um, and and eventually, because there wasn't that book, I decided I had to write it myself. Uh, the book I wanted to read, um, and but then I, I've you know multiple visits over the years to, to both sides, and I certainly you know when I'm on the territory of one side or the other, I do, I still have that feeling of oh yeah, I, I, I do get that point of view, and then I go back and forth, um, and you know that's partly a natural consequence of conflict, but it's also a bit artificial, it's a bit politically determined because, you know, when you look at the broader sweep of history, Armenians and Azerbaijanis have plenty of experience of cooperation, of intermarriage, of trade, and so on. And in, in, in the new edition of the book, I include a, a visit I made um, a couple of years ago to a village in Georgia called Khojoni, a, a very poor village which has a mixed Armenian-Azerbaijani population. A population population of you know, a couple of hundred people, mostly elderly, young people have left. Um, and no Georgians in the village apart from the local policemen, basically. Um, Armenians and Azeris kind of wandering in out, out of each other's houses, talking in the street, living together in a village in Georgia, just about a couple of miles from Armenia, maybe 20 miles from Azerbaijan. Um, now, what does this tell us? Well, clearly, these people, these people, and you ask, you ask these people, the same question in lots of different ways. Um, you know, do you have any conflicts? Your Armenians and Azerbaijanis are supposed to be enemies. Why are you friends and neighbors? Oh, no, we have no conflicts, you know. And, um, 
And clearly, these people are not more virtuous than the people a few miles away. They just happen to live in a different context. They happen to live uh, in Georgia rather than in this closed room of Armenia or Azerbaijan. They, if they, they've, got a, they've got themselves a ticket out of the conflict, as it were, by living in Georgia. Um, and they have no problem with each other, which proves that culturally, you know, socially, there's no problem between these people. It's a political construction, um, uh, this conflict. Um, a real political construction, I, I mean, you know, I, 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 with some very real issues there. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not denigrating that. But, but once you step into Georgia, you, you, you've got a ticket out of it. And I think the other difference there is, is that in Georgia, in this little village, uh, if there's a dispute, there's a Georgian policeman who can more or less take a, a fair decision. You know, if someone, someone's young as they're able to smash a young Armenian window or, ver or vice versa, then a Georgian policeman would come in and, and, and be more or less impartial and, and, and adjudicate. That's obviously what you, what you don't have in um, Azeris in Armenia or Armenians in Azerbaijan potentially don't have. And, you know, that's where we get into the who would be the policeman question, which right. in the Balkans was answered by, you know, 60,000 NATO troops. And, and um, you know, if I was to wave a magic wand and summon 60,000 NATO troops, I think we could make a lot of progress in this conflict, but um, unfortunately that's not very realistic. You, you talk about the hardening of, of attitudes of, of the government, and then um, in one point in, in the book, you, you talk about the changed attitudes toward you. <laughs> when you went to Karabakh, where you know, 10 years ago uh, or longer, 20 years ago, yeah. there was sort of a, a positive view of someone from the outside who was willing to come and listen. Now there's more, I, I'm not sure wh whether it's tension or unhappiness with the, the lack of progress. Do you see the same thing in Armenia, in Azerbaijan? Armenia is obviously of the three triangular point, geographical triangular points of the conflict. Armenia is, is the most detached, and therefore um, I feel less of a change in Armenia. Um, in Karabakh, I've noticed that, as I, as I say, I first went there in 96, and I got a very positive reception. A foreigner, oh, you're coming to visit us. The war was just over. Let's share our experiences with you. Um, they've got a bit kind of prouder and a bit more distant mm. and, and a bit more self-reliant. Uh, over the years. Um, I'm sure this is something that someone like Bob Rankin might be able to confirm as well. Um, that, that there's less of a question, oh, we, less of a, more of an attitude of, we don't need you anymore, you foreigners. We, we've, we've done this by ourselves. We've built all this up by ourselves. We don't need you. Um, and don't come with your stories about Azerbaijan and so on. We've built something here. And it, it's obviously a bit of an illusion because, you know, Karabakh is an unrecognized entity and it, it needs the world. But, but this is the kind of story they've invented them themselves. So I get much more pushback and less of a friendly reception from strangers, not from people I know personally um, in Karabakh than I used to. And I think there's this unfortunate dynamic whereby um, Azerbaijan has, is pursuing a policy of isolation of Karabakh, fearing sort of creeping recognition, quote unquote, which has actually reinforced this narrative amongst the, the Karabakh Armenians. It's actually helped push them further away. Um, Azerbaijan, I would say, is also this younger generation that, that, that you, you're talking about is also, many of them are really quite aggressive, although, again, it's, it's, it's a bit sloganizing sometimes. These are people who often haven't met an Armenian. It's a bit of a posture, perhaps more than the reality, but certainly the, the kind of the mood music in, in Azerbaijan is also more, more aggressive than it was 10 years ago. And I, I found the same thing in dealing with people who I knew during my time in Azerbaijan. I see them again. Uh, start talking and they say, you don't understand what's going on. And, and it's, you know, from an attitude where there really was, you know, interest in having the United States more engaged to a point where, you know, things have just gone, gone by, the, by the wayside now and, and you're, not in, you're, you're not looking at the same place. Uh, well, I think this, this, this can change. I, I think not the point about my Georgian story is also that this is a kind of a real and, and, and intractable political problem. But it's, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's one story, it's one narrative that has taken hold of these two societies. There are other narratives out there. There's a narrative of, of tolerance, of coexistence. And there's also a pragmatic narrative that, you know, if, if this region's ever going to move forward, you know, we've got to unblock all these 
communications open these closed borders. There's a lot of, I think there's a lot of business people who you talk to who, are, who really want to see this resolved. So I don't always take it face value, the, the, the aggressive rhetoric. I mean, it's, it's clearly a big problem. But there are, and, and this is part of you know, why I wrote the book, to, 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 to tell a, a bigger story and to probe a bit and, and, and tell stories uh, uh, of, of cooperation which are un, un, under there, under the surface. As well. Well, I, you know, I, I find I'm, I'm in agreement with a, a lot of what you say, and, and particularly the, the point about the major obstacles to peace being internal rather than external. But we do need to, to say a little bit about the, uh, the external part of this, the, the peace process. Um, you know, I, at, at one point, I think you make a very helpful dis distinction between uh, you know, maybe this is more of a conflict management process and a peace process. And, I was very struck because that was the way we used to talk about the European and U.S. attitudes in, in Bosnia. The Europeans were only interested in, in managing, mm -hmm. the, managing the conflict. Mm -hmm. And you know, these crazy Americans wanted to go out there and fix things or break things depending on the order. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and there was a, you know, really a, mm -hmm. almost a conceptual right. difference that made, made it difficult to overcome. Do you, do you see anything? Kind of like that at play in terms of the external, you know, involvement on on this. Right. Whether there's kind of a philosophical difference that makes it hard to turn this into a peace process. Well, I mean, I see. I mean, we had two days ago. We had the statement by Presidents Obama, Hollande, uh, and and Putin, which was, you know, a good statement. Made, said all the right things, and yet, of course, totally ignored. Did, did, did anyone see a single news item about it anywhere in the news coverage? You know, please put up your hands if you did in the English language, maybe even um, outside Just the region. a statement by the foreign minister of Armenia. Um, but I mean, the three yeah. presidents, yeah. you know, usually a, president, a statement by the presidents of the United States, France, and Russia would get, get a little bit of coverage, but <laughs> zero interest in this. And, you know, which on one level is unfair, but on, level, on, on another level, you know, I compare it to the previous two statements, 2012 and 2011, I looked through the text, and I'm afraid all of the three of them had the same sentence about there can be no delay in, in pursuing a, a, a peace agreement on Karabakh. So I would qualify what the Minsk group has at the moment is kind of high quality diplomacy. High, you know, mm -hmm. um, the president can be persuaded to make a phone call, the foreign ministers intervene. There's a very sophisticated uh, document out there, which is, I think is an extremely clever, sophisticated, workable uh, document the basic, based on the basic, basic principles. Um, and, um, you know, and, and so the model has always been, we come up with a very sophisticated solution, we persuade the parties to accept it, but we don't really have much else in our in our back pocket. Um, I don't think, and unfortunately, I don't think that model. I think that model is okay for managing the conflict, sort of, because the conflict is is also morphing and changing. Um, but I I, I I no longer think it's sufficient to um, resolve the conflict. So if you want to resolve the conflict, you, you've got to bring in kind of extra firepower from somewhere, be it you know a really um, big commitment that we're going to that we're going to sort out the we're going to promise a big security package which um, which will stabilize things on the ground that the, the sides can't can't agree on um, we're going to suddenly or or else and this is a much more difficult we're going to sort of take a lot of pain in our bilateral relationship with both countries and say this is our number one priority you know if you don't um, you know this is the deal if you don't accept it they'll be you'll pay a price and of course. You know, that's not what um, diplomats or the foreign ministers right. like doing with, with, with places like back or Europe. I mean, we could, we could get away with that in Bosnia because we did have 60,000. So right. we did tell people what to do. And they were pretty weak that, at that point. You know, and, and, but, you know, that is not the, the situation here. Uh, and, you know, I, as diplomats, we always look for solutions that involve compromises on both sides. And yet, uh, and this goes back to the, uh, to the biggest obstacles of peace lying inside uh, these countries, both uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, the leadership would pay a tremendous political price right. if this happened today, given the, the way the, this conflict has been portrayed, the narratives that you talked about. And do you see any possibility 
for you know applying the, the tried and true method of external involvement, absent some willingness on on the party's part to to take the take the heat that goes along with uh, with a, uh, a diplomatic agreement. Well, sure. I mean, if I'm President Ilham Aliyev or Serge Sarkisian at the moment, I probably you know I will lose a lot by doing a, um, a peace agreement. I will certainly I will probably gain a lot in the longer term, but in the short term, all I can see is headaches, pain, people on the streets, threats, and so on. And so the question is, how do you help change that cal that calculation so that they see more of the positives than, than the negatives? And you know, or us, how do you, you know get bigger sticks and, and bigger carrots? Um, and, and uh, you know, getting uh, here's where we get back to this being a kind of second order a priority. Um, um, you know, it, it would require Europeans, Americans, Russians, Turks, all for one thing, all to be fully coordinated. They're pretty much coordinated, but you know, there are some some gaps there. Um, and 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 to really come in, you know, um, beating the drum, saying this is this has got to be solved. And and I just don't think it's. Um, perceived as, as kind of important or dangerous enough for that to be the case at the moment. I, I guess what, what worries me, I guess, is, is that things would have to get worse for them to get better, that we would have to see a crisis, um, some kind of military crisis, in which, which would bring this to the top of the agenda and then people will, will get involved, but um, which, of course, raises the question, you know, why wait? Right. Well, one point you make, and I, you know, I, I maybe you could talk a little bit more about this. When you you look at the major international players, uh, and you you make the comment that there's a lack of an overarching strategy for the South Caucasus. Could you talk a little bit about that? Are you talking about you know individual countries like the United States, or right. is it sort of the need for? For the Minsk right. Group leadership to have a, a common view of of what uh, what right. strategy for international engagement in the region ought to be. Right. Well, I mean, this is I guess a theme running through my whole uh, my work as a whole, which is which is the theme that 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 over the last few hundred years the people in the Caucasus have been, <coughs> have been very skilled at playing off the great powers against each other and and of of of, of Kind of manipulating outsiders, and you know they're very good at this game because it's a game often of, sort of life and death for them. Um, and so um, I always reject the idea that the Caucasus is some kind of chessboard where great powers move pawns around. I, I see it very much the pawns moving the kings and queens around in this region. Um, but clearly, every the local players all have their own parochial interests, and it does need some uh, an outsider, a benevolent outsider, to, to kind of see the, the, the picture as a whole and see that, you know, fix the railways, um, open up the borders, get this region moving, you know, this region is lagging behind economically, or um, Turkey or Russia, um, you know, and, and, and there needs to be a kind of grand vision for that. But I, what I see at the moment is that the parochial always trumping the, um, the, the kind of the strategic vision. Um, you know, a few years ago, we might have hoped that the EU was the player which was going to have this, you know, identify this as the kind of the next Balkan, it's the place that, that, that we could have a strategic vision for. But unfortunately, as we know, the EU has got distracted in its own problems, and I don't see that happening. Um, and I don't, to be honest, see anyone else who's got such a strong interest. Um, the, the Turks on some level, but um, anyway, it's, you know, it's frustrating. Yeah, and I, you know, I think part of the problem for the United States when we look at the region now, we, you know, at least listening to, to people in this town talk about it, it's largely seen in terms of what happens, you know, between now and 2014 in protecting the uh, the supply routes uh, to Afghanistan and energy. And yet, I think if you look at the, the global situation, the energy game has changed so dramatically that to make a you know, a, a, a sort of an overarching strategy in this region based around energy and, and an east-west transportation route, maybe looking backward rather than, than forward. I mean, that, that's just my, my personal, uh, personal opinion. Um, but, you know, I think, I think you're right. We'll, you know, we, the reality is this is a second order issue and likely to remain so absent a... Second order is better than third order. Well, I guess it is. Uh, <laughs> But uh, still, it, it's uh, you know it is uh, it's a challenge of how do you 
you know, create the, the critical mass of international engagement to, to overcome that. Um, you talk about the risk of war um, in, in your conclusion right. to this. Um, would, would you it, it kind of contrast your sense of that now to where it was when you wrote the initial volume? Yeah. Do you think it's, it's more likely now than it was 10 years ago? And if so, why? Um, definitely more likely, still quite small, but growing, I would say. And, and clearly, um, as, we, as we all know, Azerbaijan is now spending around $4 billion a year on its military, which is uh, self-consciously a figure higher than the Armenian, entire Armenian state budget. Now, the, the, uh, when you talk to the Azerbaijanis, they say this is a strategy um, you know, to coerce the Armenians into, into you know, doing a deal with us. Um, this is kind of, you know, in, in making them spend more money, to get them into an unsustainable arms race and so on. And, and when President Aliyev makes some fairly belligerent speeches, there's usually a let out clause which saying, you know, we, um, we are prepared for war, but of course we, we prefer peace. Um, but of course the Armenians don't hear the, usually hear the, um, the second part of that message. Uh, I don't think rationally anyone um, you know, expects to see a, a can, can see the logic of a war. You know, Azerbaijan would be making enormous risk with, given the, the, the terrain, given the, the problems there. Um, but what, what worries me is, is, that there, is that there could be a kind of war by miscalculation that um, because you've got this ceasefire line 160 miles long with you know, snipers and, and, and 20,000 troops on either side, that at some point, Either side, for political reasons, could stage an incident, an operation, for maybe there's a domestic crisis going on in the country. Um, one side stages something, the other side responds, and then there's a kind of call from the streets that we must do something, and at which point um, the president decides to, to act, um, and, and we, get a, we kind of enter into a war by, by accident in which the president on either side, probably more like the Azerbaijan, you know, decides that that um, you know, I can't back down now. Um, and at which point, of course, there are all sorts of people, the generals particularly, saying, we can do this. You know, it's, um, you know, it's in general's job description to, to, to tell politicians, well, some generals, that they can win a war. Um, and of course, I think the other problem is that both as they have so little contact, they, don't, they, they are very bad at reading the other side. Um, there are still people on the Armenian side who believe um, I think possibly mistakenly that they have this great military superiority over Azerbaijan, and therefore that if something starts, we can, we can lick them. Um, and um, that's also a temptation for some people on the Armenian side. Well, why wait again? We, if we're going to fight a war, we might as well fight it sooner rather than later. Now, let me qualify all of that by saying I still think war is a bit unlikely, but I think uh, there's this unhealthy trend line in that direction. Um, we're certainly <coughs> not there yet, but what, the way we're going we could arrive there in three, four, five years' time. Well, I've always felt that in, you know, when in the discussion about whether there will or will not be war, the role of Russia is, is very critical. And whatever you know, one may think of Russian motivations and in the region and uh, attitudes toward the, uh, the Minsk group process and uh, achieving a peace, a peace settlement. On the other hand, I don't think Russia has an interest in, in a war breaking out on their on no, the southern point. southern borders, so I think that that's another factor which uh, right. which needs to be needs right. to be brought in. Um, you you spend a lot of time at the at the very end talking about the importance of a third narrative, um, and uh, you know you, you you talk about trying to get people to to look at this conflict and its resolution in terms of, you know, there are no angels right. here that uh, competing claims which seem to be mutually exclusive somehow have to, mm -hmm. have to be looked at differently. And, and you know, the, the ultimate point, and we, we use this line in the Balkans too, uh, you're going to have to live with one another because right. nobody's going to decamp to another planet or uh, to the United States or whatever would, would happen. Um, Walk through how, how you would see the process of developing that narrative to the point, again, so that it overcomes the entrenched yeah. domestic attitudes that you described earlier. Yeah. Well, clearly, I mean, the point 
about a third narrative is that there's, there's two, probably more than two, but two basic narratives out there which basically fill, fill the space, fill the media space, fill the diplomatic space. Um, and despite the US and the France and, and Russia, these two, three pretty powerful countries being the Coaches and the Minsk Group, they're pretty timid about public diplomacy, about, about contradicting these, these aggressive narratives. Now, I realize that's not really the job of a, of a co-chair, someone like um, Bob Bradke, who you know, has to spend hours in a room with these people. Um, but, but, the, but there really needs to be other people out there who you know, need to be giving an alternative message that, you know, as, you say, as we say, these people have to live together. They have lived together in the past. Painful compromise is needed on both sides. Um, there's much to be gained by peace. Pretty, some pretty obvious things. Supporting the, the, the kind of beleaguered minorities in, in, in both countries who, who, who believe that but, but don't get heard. Making some speeches, supporting media outlets that, 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 that are prepared to carry this message. Sort of not letting the entire, all of the airwaves just be filled by these, these, these two narratives. I think getting that third narrative um, out there uh, publicly um, is, is, is really, you know, part of the solution or part of the beginning of the solution to this conflict. Part of what has concerned me about internally in Azerbaijan is that, and I won't speak for Armenia because I don't know that as well, but there, there isn't the political space existing today that would allow people to begin that kind of conversation without immediately being yeah. accused of you know, being a traitor or, right. you know, and, and it's, it seems to me that the, you know, the third narrative needs, needs right. a place to, to be developed and, and part of it has to be in, internally right. in, in all of these That's, these that's definitely a problem. I mean, there is a bit of space in Armenia, more space definitely than there is in, in Azerbaijan. Karabakh, almost no space, but in Armenia there is some space. But Azerbaijan, I mean, we have the, the recent case of the writer Akram Ailis Lee writing this novel um, in which he, he wrote, he kind of had, a, had very much a different narrative about the conflict um, and being publicly um, vilified. So that, that definitely um, sent the wrong message. So yeah, um, it's, it's not an optimistic picture. Yeah. Um. You know, as I as I got through the uh, through the end of, of this and thought about the uh, the international process, uh, you know, it, it it seemed to me that you know maybe there were uh, some choices. Uh, some some of these may not be real choices given what the presidents have said about mm -hmm. continuing the process. But um, you know, there there are some some things that the international community, both formally governments, but informally uh, NGOs and, and others need to be thinking about. Um, as I mentioned, one choice is the status quo, and that seems to be what, mm -hmm. what we've, we've decided to embark on. Uh, there's another possibility, and, it, and that is that, that somehow the international community decides that maybe this is time to not walk away from the process, but try to see if it's possible to allow these bridge builders, as right. you, you mentioned, to kind of emerge from from within in these uh, in both or all three uh, three locations. Um, you know, enhance track two mm -hmm. process. We we know how difficult that can be, but it, it's it's kind of to to get to the conditions precedent of tolerance and trust to enable right. the the normal government-to-government mm -hmm. -government negotiating process to, to continue. Um, I know people always say, well, let's, uh, the, the, as a third choice, let's increase the level of representation in the Minsk group. Mm -hmm. But it strikes me that if you, you, you just simply have a, a more higher ranking uh, person from, from right. each of the Minsk group countries, and yet the parties themselves have not altered their basic position, right. um, you kind of frustrate senior senior officials and not really lead to, to any result. Um, yeah, I mean, I see. Sorry, I, I just I see the Minsk Group as being a, a bit of a a, um, a vessel. I mean, what you put into the Minsk Group is what is yeah. what you get out of it, um, and that implies to the U.S., France, and Russia on the one hand. Also applies to to the Armenians and the Azerbaijanis in particular. You know um, that um, you know. So we should be sort of. You know, it should be JFK's question, you know, 
not ask, don't ask what the Mintz group can do for you, ask what you can do for the Mintz group. <laughs> well, I, I, I think there's another choice, and I, I will just simplify this by saying the international community takes over the process. You, you describe the process essentially as the, you know, Armenia and Azerbaijan in particular kind of controlling the pace and, right. and all by, by virtue of the way they, they structure it. But if, you know, if somehow the international community, maybe along the lines of, of the Balkans, uh, became more, more involved, trying to bring in more formally Turkey, trying to encourage particularly the, 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 the opening that was begun unsuccessfully between Turkey and Armenia, uh, maybe a Dayton-like process where uh, it, it might even be worth considering whether to, you know, impose an international supervisor for Nagorno-Karabakh. I mean, if you really had had a lot of political oomph behind, behind this, it, it would require some sort of international peacekeeping operation, as well as the agreement of the Russians to, in particular, to do this. But it seems to me those are kind of the four. I, the I four mean, choices I, I, out there sure. for, I mean, I, for moving this along. That's definitely an option, but I think there is a lesson here, which is, you know, only start something like that if you're going to see it through to the end. Somewhere in yeah. here I have a, a quote. I, I probably can't find it. For, I think it's from 2006. I, I, um, I, should, I should have picked it out, which basically is the Mintz group saying, uh, our creativity is exhausted. It's up to the parties to, you know, to sort this out. We, we, you know, basically, we've had enough. Um, and then that's, you know, this big demarche from the, from the Minsk group, which was, you know, I could feel quite sympathetic towards. And then, right. of course, a few months later, um, they just came back to the table as normal as though nothing had happened. So I don't know, maybe we should... Yeah, let's, uh, let's hear somebody else. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I've, I've got the honor of uh, trying to, to moderate the audience questions. I, I will... There is a microphone. There. Yeah, I will ask, I will ask people... Uh, and I, I hope you will you will honor this. A, identify yourself. B, ask a question. And C, don't get offended if I shut you up, because you know I've been in enough meetings on this topic to know that uh, this is a, a wonderful opportunity to make speeches of one kind or another. So let's let's try to to keep it uh, you know to keep it very focused. Ask Tom in particular, specific questions, and uh, keep the, uh, what, it, what is obviously a very emotional topic uh, to a level of, of civilized differences, if that's where, where we are. So, Bob, you're, you ought to get something out all the time you put into this process, <laughs> so you get the first question. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bob Brackey, uh, former Mintz Group co-chair from 2009 to uh, just the end of last year. You guys ought to have an alumni association or something. That's right. Uh, I will ask a question, but I want to start with an endorsement. Uh, when I started as Mintz Group co-chair, the uh, first book that I read was Tom's uh, book, uh, Black Garden. It's uh, where I kind of came to grips with some of the issues that I was going to face. But it wasn't just reading it at the beginning, it was leaving it on my desk, and it is the one book I had in my office, and I kept going back to it time and time again because of the effectiveness that uh, Tom sh uh, has in describing the issues that are there and the human cost, uh, as you say, it combines both the history of this conflict with the human side of this conflict. It's a reminder of the human suffering, the human cost of this conflict, so again, uh, uh, I'm sure the, the revised edition is going to be equally valuable to anyone who wants to, to uh, learn about this problem, but also the people who are involved in trying to solve this problem. Um, the, the kind of question I have here, and, and, and again, I know both of you have talked about getting this issue to the top of the agenda or uh, uh, making it a first order issue. Uh, I'm less persuaded that that, that is the, the, the key to solving this uh, because I do feel from my own experience that the problem is the resistance, the internal resistance, the unwillingness of the parties to make the, the decisions they need to make. And both of you alluded to increasing the price. How do you increase the price? Uh, I didn't hear a lot of specifics on that front, so I'm curious whether you have specific things you think can be done in the way of sanctions, in the way of, of some kind of penalty, some kind of price that sides can be made to pay. Because I think for Azerbaijan, which has a tremendous amount of resources, it's hard to think of an economic price uh, 
uh, for Armenia, which is very determined because of the way this conflict unfolded, and for the Karabakhis themselves, it's hard to see the political price that, that would be high enough. So again, when you say to increase the price to overcome that internal resistance, what specifically might be done? Thank you. Um, it's a very good question. Um, and, um, you know, this is also, we, um, well, thank you, first of all, Bob, for your, for your kind, kind words. Um, I hope it won't still be on the desk of a press group. <laughs> <laughs> ten years from now. Co-chair in ten years' time. I'd be quite happy if this book gets outdated for, for good reasons. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, this is a good question. Um, it's about leverage. Um, and, um, and it's about, um, you know, what do these countries want that we could either give them or, or sort of deny them until they, you know, get on, on, a, on a better path. Um, um, and obviously the dynamic with Azerbaijan um, is changing. Uh, Azerbaijan um, in, in 2014 will be a very uh, crucial country because of transit from Afghanistan. 2015, um, you know, what, will be, uh, what will be the relationship with Azerbaijan? Maybe that would be a moment in which you, could, you might actually consider um, is this a moment to kind of you know, rewrite a, a contract with, with Azerbaijan, which has more positive incentives now that, um, and, and also some sticks as well. Um, Armenia, it's interesting, is, is proceeding in fits and starts in a, in a bit of an um, EU direction. They're, 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 they're looking at the deep, deep and comprehensive free trade area with the EU. Um, Armenia, clearly, um, there are big economic incentives to um, to, to sorting out this conflict. So I think there, there, the, um, Armenia one can see more leverage there. But of course, there's a huge, um, you know, in the parliaments, in fact, the parliaments, as it happens, of the three co chair countries, France, Russia, and US, there, there are big uh, Armenian equities, big, you know, um, big Armenian lobbies. So, so you have to deal with that. I, so all of which, you know, means, yeah, don't, don't embark on something like this lightly, that if you decide that now is the moment, then you've got to prepare, you know, fasten your seatbelts, prepare yourself for a, a bumpy ride if you really want to, 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 to take that route of a more kind of coercive uh, um, diplomacy. I, I hate to think in terms of sticks, but, you know, as, as we get past 2014 and the, the importance for, for our own strategic interests of that, you know, maintaining that northern supply route are lessened. Uh, and as I said earlier, the energy situation, it may be possible to, you know, to talk about taking more direct action that would involve both Azerbaijan and Armenia. But just as an outsider now looking at it, we, we seem to have other interests that would prevent that from happening. You would hope you could create a positive incentive for this, but I must say, uh, it's just hard to imagine something that would really attract. I'm sorry. Let me get one directly behind Wayne, sir, with your Can you wait for the microphone, please? OK, thank you. Mikhail Mamedov, Georgetown University. Uh, thank you for very interesting presentation, and thank you for the uh, second edition of the book. I have not read it yet, uh, but I used your first edition. To, I read the first edition several times. I read it first when it came, came up, and I used it for my course on the Caucasus at Georgetown University. My question is, uh, uh, well, I have a lot of questions, but the first question is, you mentioned the village Hojani, and you mentioned that Armenians and Azeris lived over there side by side, and with, there is no conflicts over there, and there is only one Georgian policeman, and it it's often depends on he, him, uh, how he would interfere if uh, the window is Armenian or Azeri window is broken from time to time. But you also mentioned in your first book that Baku was a multi big multi-ethnic, multicultural city before 1990, where Armenians, Russians, Azeris, Jews lived together side by side. And I assume that a policeman at that time was Russian. Uh, but by 1990, all Armenians were gone, and almost all Russians were gone, and almost all Jews were gone. 
too, but I wonder uh, what were the fault of this Russian policeman? Uh, when did he fail, failed and at what point he could have done his job better? And at what point he could have done this job better? And what would you, I mean, it's not always good to go into back into past, but what would he have done better if you were giving this recommendation to this Russian policeman? It's the first question. And the second question, I know it's not always good to speculate. Yeah. And two, two questions are matched. Okay, and the second question. I know, I mean, if you, if, I probably know that there are a lot of Armenians immigrated to the United States from Baku, and there are a lot of Jews who immigrated to the United States too. A lot of them immigrated after 1990. And did you ever try to conduct any interviews among these people? For, your, for the second edition of your book. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me start with the second question. Um, no interviews with sort of, I mean, I, um, I've certainly, these Bakubians, <laughs> Bakila, Bakasi, uh, are, I, I enjoy their company. They're probably the people I most feel most kind of comfortable with on this conflict because they're the people who see it most in, in the round. Um, people, um, you know, with from mixed marriages, uh, I think like yourself, if I'm not revealing a secret, um, who um, people, you know, have this rather internationalist outlook. And as I mentioned in, in the essay um, that, that we just published, you know, some of the best, most positive letters I got for the book were, were from these, these Bakuvians, these Bakinsi. Um, when did the Russian policeman stop doing his job? Well, I mean, I suppose you could argue that um, that relatively quickly in the Soviet system, he, he, the Russian policeman became someone to be feared rather than to be trusted. And of course, you know, therefore, when the fear was removed when, in, in the perestroika era, um, that policeman lost his authority. Um, if it had been, if it had been a, a trusted policeman based on the rule of law, like in other societies, then, then maybe that policeman could have, you know, uh, have, have done a proper enforcement job. But uh, as the people of Baku experienced, um, that Russian policeman didn't really do his job. And in January 1990, first of all, you had the pogroms against Armenians, uh, and then the intervention by Soviet forces in which lots of Azerbaijanis were killed. In both cases, you know, the Russian policeman, first of all, uh, did nothing to stop the intervention, um, did nothing to stop people being killed, and in the second um, position, actually actively killed people. So that, that wasn't a very good endorsement of the Russian policeman. So, Wayne, do you want to? Uh, Wayne. Then after Wayne, we'll go to the very back in the white shirt. Okay. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. Uh, first, as this is a book launch, I think it's worth noting that I believe there are copies of the book available for sale to members oh. of the audience. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I'll give wouldn't, you wouldn't, wouldn't, want them, wouldn't want them to go you'll unsold. You'll get your commission later, thank you. Uh, and second, a, a question. You both referred to essentially uses of external forces, either in a crisis, as a result of a crisis, or as part of some kind of a robust peacekeeping mission. And I suppose my question is, from whence these forces are to come? In the Balkans in the 90s, we were in the post-Cold War peace dividend when there were sort of surplus battalions and extra <coughs> money uh, all around. Um, if I think of the, I believe, 18 countries in the Minsk group, let alone the 50 plus countries in the OSCE, I can think of not one whose force structure is not enormously reduced and whose budgetary stringency is not, at the moment, considerable. I can think of no countries other than, you know, perhaps China, from which, <laughs> from which such forces would come other than the three regional great powers themselves, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. Uh, and in each and all three cases, there are, of course, complications. But my question is, you know, I, everybody I know in the US military has had five, six, if not more deployments. And I can tell you, 16, 17 years ago, when I was in the, in the Pentagon, Joint Staff didn't want to talk about a peacekeeping force in Karabakh then. Today, I think they would mutiny. So where are these forces going to come from? It's a very good question. I think maybe you've just answered it with the word China. Um, <laughs> but, um, but seriously, I was, I, 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 
actually was a meeting a couple of years ago where this um, question came up, and a British diplomat said, we don't have enough Finns. Um, <laughs> <laughs> his, his kind of policy prescription was to increase the population of Finland. But, um, but I think this is it's a very good question, and, and you know, and, and um, this again speaks to the intractability of this conflict. I do think you, de you do need a, for the, for a, do need a decent peacekeeping force on the ground. The geography is such that for people to return home and for the Armenians to withdraw from their positions, you do need a decent peacekeeping force. And, and who is that peacekeeping force going to be composed of? Um, so maybe, maybe if, it, if it's down to budgets, then you, then you, you should start to, I guess, think of the cost-benefit analysis of, of, of how much money can be saved by, by a peace in Karabakh, um, which could be usefully spent on the peace, peacekeeping force. But, uh, well, I'm, I'm glad, glad uh, Wayne asked that question because now I know who is making the DOD people in my interagency group when we were talking about an OSCE force be very reluctant to volunteer. So, no, but I, you know, when you think back to the time when, when uh, uh, Jack Maresco was, uh, was Bob's predecessor, uh, then the issue was could you come up with an OSCE presence, uh, i.e. military presence, uh, beyond the, the, the sort of observers, monitors. But it, it ran into the, I mean, this was before everything. I mean, this was before Bosnia, Balkans, before Iraq and Afghanistan and, and you know, the place where we are today. We couldn't even come up with it, with it then. But the real question is, and I, I think it goes to Tom's, how do you, you know, how do you build the trust so that the Armenians will be willing to withdraw from the occupied territories that it will be possible for Azerbaijanis from, uh, from Karabakh to return home and to be there in a, in a position, again, of security and trust. You, you have to have some, some presence. Now, whether it would have to be a, you know, a 65,000 person NATO force, or maybe it's a mixture of you know, paramilitary police uh, under some UN or, or other umbrella, I don't know. But um, you know, you'd have you'd have to look at a different different model, I think, for that for that to work here. In the uh, Vilan Kolgatian Political Developments Research Center. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for for doing the talk. Uh, my question is, uh, Tom, you, you mentioned that uh, a possibility of domestic situation being used as an excuse to launch a war, so as to divert basically. Well, not so much a war, but possibly some kind of military okay. diversion which get, gets out of control. Okay, okay. yes, yes, that's, that's what I, I want to address. Um, Azerbaijan has elections coming up in the fall. Uh, how do you see that going, and do you, do you see that as possibly an event that could trigger something that you suggested? Thank you. Um, I would be very surprised if, 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 if the Azerbaijani elections could be a trigger for something like that. I would be, I'm more projecting into the future for some more unforeseen uh, crisis, which we, we don't anticipate. I think, you know, I think these elections are pro probably going to be a bit more lively than we would have anticipated a few months ago. We've, there's been a number of protests in Azerbaijan this year. There's been a bit of a, a, a certain a crackdown on a number of, of activists, which I think um, could, could produce a more kind of uh, heated election uh, environment that we would have anticipated a few months ago. But that's a long way from saying that this is going to be an excuse for, for a kind of military uh, crackdown in Karabakh. What, what I am worried about, um, and I think the State Department is, is, is very focused on, is, is this issue about the, the airport um, in Karabakh. Um, both sides have really drawn some red lines which it's going to be difficult for them to retreat mm. from. The Armenians have refurbished and rebuilt the airport in Karabakh, and they say they're going to fly planes in. Uh, the Azerbaijanis say this contravenes the Ch Chicago Convention, which it does. Um, they initially want, made one or two threats saying that they might shoot down an air airplane. Um, that's, I think those threats have, have, have been withdrawn, but um, certainly the Armenian side is quite likely in the next few months to, to, um, to fly in a plane to Karabakh at this new airport. Um, and then we might see uh, some kind of Azerbaijani response because and this is the commitment they've made, whether it be a couple of rockets landing on the airstrip in the middle of the night or some other response on the line of contact, who knows. But, but certainly, if the Armenians were to do that, it could spark uh, 
a flashpoint. Um, and um, so we're very much watching this space and hoping that that doesn't you know, spark a long, hot summer on, on, on the ceasefire line. I would just add that I, I think in the political process in Azerbaijan, the rhetoric on Nagorno-Karabakh will heat up during this period from, from the government side if Ilham Aliyev is, is the candidate. Uh, I think, well, he is, he is nominated as now. Yeah, I, well, I didn't want to presume anything, uh, not having followed it that carefully. You know, he has his own yeah. history of, of using NK's rhetorical point. And depending on who, who is allowed to run on the opposition, some of the traditional opposition political leaders were directly involved during, right. during the war in Karabakh and, and are seen as, in some sense, responsible for the loss. And I so think that's so I, could see, I could see both the opposition trying to counter the, the increased rhetoric, perhaps by being more nationalistic. It's just I think that's actually a point worth making that Musabat and the Popular Front yes. take more aggressive lines than, than, yeah. than the government does. Sorry, there was a, yeah, back here in the, that side. Then I'll, I'll slip back to the right. I'm trying to give the right and the left equal balance, but. Uh, my name is Ramis Hazadeh. Uh, I'm a student of the Azerbaijan Diplomatic Academy. Uh, so before addressing my question, I want to notice some two details about the ceasefire line between the Azerbaijan and Armenia. Uh, despite the fact that the ceasefire between two sides of the conflict, Azerbaijan and Armenia, was signed. Uh, nowadays, we can see some of the bloody results of the across the yeah, the ceasefire line, and the target uh, of the Armenian soldiers are becoming Azerbaijan civil populations, which are living nearby the ceasefire line. Uh, this is the first point, and the second point is related with the <coughs> violent acts of the Armenians toward those Azerbaijanis who were captivated during the uh, war, during the conflict itself. Uh, and uh, my question is, uh, which uh, international uh, instruments can be developed in order to stop violent acts of the Armenian? Thank you. Sure, I'm not quite sure what you meant by in your second point, when you say violent acts. I don't know if you... Uh, I mean, uh, those who were captivated during the Nagorno-Karabakh war, uh, those people living in the Armenia are as a slavery uh, they are forced to, uh, to the acts of the slavery. Therefore, uh, I want to know your opinion and approach right. toward uh, our right. Azerbaijani okay. yeah, nationals. Well, I think I'm, I'm quite sympathetic with your first point there about, because it certainly if you look at the line of contact on, on one side, on the Armenian side, there's kind of empty land and soldiers, and on the Azerbaijani side, there are civilians. So it's, it's true that civilians are much more endangered on the on, on the Azerbaijani side of the ceasefire line than, than Armenians. Um, but I think I, I, I would, I, I, I don't, I haven't seen any substantiated reports which would confirm your second point that, that Azeris are, are captured and enslaved. I think the Red Cross has pretty much unrestricted access to anyone who who's, uh, crosses the line, who's taken captive, and I haven't seen any thankfully, any, any reports that we can found that. Although, you know, I'm always ready to read them. One of my frustrations at the time was that there were NGOs in both Armenia and Azerbaijan who were interested in the fate of the families and, and of people who were being held captive. And in the case of the Azerbaijani NGO, they were not allowed to function because, again, it's back mm -hmm. to this attitude of, well, if you're trying to help you know, look at reciprocal conditions that somehow you Well, I mean, this is one, actually one of the hidden tragedies of this conflict is that there are a lot of people who are, quote, missing in action, who are clearly almost certainly dead, um, but who are lying in graves, unmarked graves, um, probably on around the Karabakh zone and not being dug up and won't be. And I don't, those sites will not be revealed until a, a peace settlement is made. Sorry, over on this, this site, very front here on... Thank you. Um, Ulvi Ismail, um, formerly with USAID and uh, was UNHCR at the time of the first writing of the book when I had the honor to travel with Tom um, to the front line on, on Azera side. Um, my question is, where does the need came um, to write, uh, to do this revision of the book? Um, and uh, did, did you have in mind maybe writing a new book about what has happened in the past and maybe with what scenarios you see as a future, you know, 
as a as a solution for this conflict. What what could be uh, right. coming? Um, so that's the first question. And, and second question maybe, um, do you think, because no one better than you would know this conflict. So, And the second question is, are there any, um, what are the revisions and additions of this book that you think will cause equal interest or scandals right. as it happened in the first book? Well, uh, quite quite recorded good. in each. Okay, well, thank, th you. thank you, Ulvi. And, and, and it's true that Ulvi and I, when I in the Fizzoli region, the Azerbaijan, the bit of Fizzoli region that Azerbaijan still controls, he and I traveled there in, I think, the year 2000. Hopefully, we haven't got too many gray hairs since then. <laughs> um, and, and I describe that in the book. Um, I, I made a conscious decision, and this really answers both your questions, to keep the core of the book the same. I, um, obviously, when you read something that you wrote 10 years ago, you think, oh, I don't like that, I don't like that. But I realized that if I started to rewrite it, one, I would have to rewrite the whole book, and two, and possibly even more important, a certain group of, of rather pedantic Armenians and Azerbaijanis would go through and say, why did he use this word and not that word? And, and I decided I would leave. So the core of the book remains yeah. the same. Uh, a few, you know, 10 or 12, mainly quite minor factual revisions. Uh, better maps, which I'm glad to see, because the last maps were not very good. One or two new photos. There's a photo which um, was politically um, difficult to publish last time because President Kocharian was, was president, but I haven't, I decided to publish it this time, which is someone, an Azeri friend of his gave me, of which Kocharian in 1986 in Yalta, sitting with a group of Karabakhi friends, some of whom are Azeri, which is an illustration of the fact that two years before the conflict began, Robert Kocharian was happy to go on holiday with some Azerbaijanis. I think that's a positive thing. I, I didn't put that in the book to embarrass him. I, I actually put that in the book because I think that's rather a, a positive thing. But, um, but I'm sure people will, will certainly pay attention to that photograph. Um, and um, hopefully no you know, scandalous moments. Hopefully, I'm sure some people will say, ah, he's moved more in a pro-Armenian direction or he's moved more in a pro-Azerbaijani direction. Um, and um, when I was asked this question one too many times, and, well, I, you know, once in the last 10 years made you more pro-Armenian or more pro-Azeri, I got rather exasperated and said, no, it's made me more pro-Georgian. <laughs> <laughs> um, even though I still like my uh, Armenian and uh, Azerbaijani friends, of course. Um, so um, I think, and I, you know, if, if someone else had come along and, and written a, a, a great book, I would have welcomed this. It does, um, I'm surprised that actually there's so little lit literature in, in English on this conflict. Um, I wrote you know, I wrote a book on Chechnya with Carlos Agul, and since then there have been 10 or 12 excellent books on Chechnya, which I think, you know, amplify the literature. How many books on Bosnia? There must be dozens. And, and so it's a bit of a mystery to me as to why there are a few, so few books on this literature. Clearly, it does, you have to, it's a lot of travel, I say, you know, to get, get around this region. That may be one reason, reason, but it can't be the whole region. Directly behind, yeah. Then I'll move to the other end. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tom, for a uh, new book. Um, your presence in general, I think, has had a significant... I'm Arsene Kharaj, I'm from Voice of America, sorry for not introducing myself. Um, has had a significant impact in the public, diplomatic, and other discourse in this town. Um, uh, you are basically the fact checker sitting there, and it's, it's tough to fool around and, and, and bring up things that are simply not true. And, and, and for that reason, I think the quality of discussion on Nagorno-Karabakh definitely uh, grew and, and has been higher since you came. I have two questions and, uh, and one offer for you. Um, uh, my question, my first question is uh, a very specific question. In case of a possible renewed military uh, process, uh, will, will the war be full scale throughout the whole border, meaning Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. And the second question is uh, about something that we haven't been very successful, unfortunately, uh, and that is, um, what is ex what is it exactly that the two governments or the parties or the NGOs across the board should be preparing their publics for? Now you mentioned should we should the Armenians talk about these six territories should be gone, so that we can have peace. And should the Azerbaijani uh, groups talk about, well, Nagorno-Karabakh itself is not a matter of discussion. I mean, or, or, or whatever it right. is. 
And, and, and uh, just a quick uh, comment on your 2015. It may actually be a the bad date considering the centenary of the Armenian Genocide. So, I mean, I don't know how much. It can actually be helpful. <laughs> I don't know where we will be back by, by, by right. that time. Uh, but my, 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 my offer will be, have you ever considered writing a script for a movie on this? And I am very serious about this. As you have uh, 10 years after the conflict, you are rewriting the book with, it, with an additional chapter. Maybe some artsy, creative approach with the uh, 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 right. information you have could be helpful. Thank you. Right. You're not going to have any time left, Tom, to yeah. write in all these books. Uh. Well, I was quite jealous of my colleague, Tom Carver, who I don't know if he's here, who was, got a call one day because um, he'd spent a lot of time in, in Bosnia and got it saying, hello, I'm An Angelina Jolie and I want to talk to you about Bosnia. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the call. <laughs> um, but maybe I'll <laughs> you, can, you can facilitate. Um, um, on, on, on the other issues, um, sorry, you have to, you have to remember. Yeah, the, 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 the war issue. Um, um, I'm, I mean, I think that the, in, in, during the, the, the conflict in the 90s, Yerevan maintained this fiction that it wasn't involved in the war. Everyone knew it was, but it was a fiction that this is a war between the Karabakh Armenians and, and, um, and Baku, in which we kind of give some modest assistance. But clearly that wasn't the case. But, but you know, <coughs> that illusion is now been, has been unmasked. So, so I think, you know, if there was to be, uh, as, as the Russians say, um, um, a... Um, God forbid a, a, a new conflict. I think it would be it would we would be looking at a conflict, you know, between the, the states of Armenia and Azerbaijan, which incidentally gets back to Rich's point about the Russians, because the Russians would then be in a big bind because they have a military obligation to <coughs> Armenia, um, but obviously also considerable stakes and equities in Azerbaijan. So they would be, as it were, obliged to to um, go to help Armenia and, and lose everything that they had in, in Azerbaijan. What, what could you talk to your publics about? Well, I think you should start by, by saying, by talking about the six basic principles. That seems to be a good start. There, there, are, there, are, there are six of them. And um, at the moment, they're kind of rather, quoted rather selectively. The Armenian side likes talking about the a vote on, on the status. And the uh, uh, Azerbaijani side likes talking about the return of, of refugees. Um, but, you know, have a decent uh, conversation on the public television of both sides that these six principles are, are a coherent whole. Um, they involve um, some compromises for us, but we get other things in return. Um, that's where I would begin. We've probably got time for just a couple quick questions. So if uh, starting here and then you and... Okay, we have the Armenian... Andronik from the Army, we should probably have someone from the Azari Embassy as well. Okay, I, I don't know. Looking for someone. In the fourth row. Fourth row? Okay. okay. You, you override my order. Well, I just. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh, Andronik Kovanisan, Embassy of Armenia. I would like to congratulate for the second edition of your book. Um, obviously, the first one was very well uh, inter received, a very great interest in the region and beyond. Uh, I haven't read the uh, book, the new edition itself, but uh, recently you have published an article and it's posted on the website of um, Carnegie Endowment. There you have a point there that you have just uh, repeated here about the, uh, that the countries, outsiders, with, with, which have stakes in Nagorno-Karabakh conflict may have some more active role and should be more vocal in resolution of a conflict. I would like to ask you to elaborate a little bit more, to open for us, to uncover for us, who, whom do you mean saying uh, our outsiders? Um, and what are the stakes which we, we can gain in uh, right. Nagorno-Karabakh conflict resolution? Thank Thank you. Well, I think that um, I, that's a thank you, Andrew Nick. That's a, a, a very good question, um, and I think there are a number of, of 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 kind of actors who have a stake in the peaceful outcome of, of the conflict, who are as it were underutilized at the moment. Which is again not, I would I repeat, not an argument for for reinventing the Minsk Group, but just for sort of buttressing it, widening it a bit. Um, 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 well, Georgia is one is an interesting one, although Georgia has its own issues, but you know, Georgia has a huge material stake in, in, in the peaceful outcome of this conflict. Uh, Turkey, although Turkey has its own internal contradictions in its foreign policy, but again has an enormous amount to gain from, from a peaceful resolution of this conflict. Um, Iran, it's probably a bit too soon to talk about Iran, but, but 
possibly in the future. Um, and uh, you know, and again, the European Union, which is which <coughs> continues to frustrate us with its um, is the kind of mirage disappearing over the over over the hill of of, of a. Of a um, but um, you know, I, I think the EU has this enormous <laughs> expertise um, from the Balkans, right. um, which some of at least some of which could be transferable to, to, to Karabakh, and I'd like to see um, a bit more creative thinking about that. So for the Embassy of Azerbaijan, I don't know who all the folks are. Thank you for giving the floor for me. <clears throat> um, one quick question. You said that uh, Azerbaijani side, uh, particularly the youth in Azerbaijan, is more aggressive. As you may know better than us, uh, we do have, Azerbaijan does have, more than 600,000 IDPs in our property, yep. Have you ever uh, tried to talk to them? And uh, just for having answered to your question, I mean, uh, yeah. why you are, let's say, as you said, sure. aggressive, more, uh, more aggressive than Armenia side? Thank you very much. Right. Well, I mean, the, um, I have talked, I mean, there are, IDPs in my book, as you as you probably know, who I've who I've spent time with, and people like Ulvi, in fact, have, have introduced me to. So, um, absolutely, I, I'm when I say the Azerbaijani side is, is is aggressive. I understand that that's not coming out of nowhere. I understand that it's coming out of you know real people who've had suffered real things in their lives. Um, um, you know, even though I'm intellectually critical of them because I don't think it's leading anywhere I'm emotionally I can I can I can understand that um, but but I I also noticed something else which is that, that there's a this this kind of schizophrenia um, double think um, that that we that we I observe in the Caucasus that often people from Karabakh as areas for example are the most divided people here because those are the people who lived amongst Armenians they remember Armenians often have um, used to have Armenian friends and neighbours, so they, they often, you know, have a good memories from the past, and yet these are also the people who lost most. And I do, so I do believe the Kara Azerbaijanis of Karabakh are people who deserve more of a voice um, in this conflict. Um, I've said that when I say this on the Armenian side, um, I become unpopular, but I do, but I, I do believe um, they clearly don't have the same kind of power factor as the Armenians of Karabakh, who actually possess. Power, but the Armenians of, of uh, the Azerbaijanis of Karabakh do do definitely deserve being listened to for exactly the reasons that, that you mentioned. One last question, we'll, we'll, oh. since we and then oh. we have to stop, and then we, and then we have Jim. Who, oh yeah. I have a question. My name is Nikki Kazimova, and uh, I'm with Echo Newspaper in Baku. Uh, so I wanted to ask a question from Tom and a short question from Rich Kozlerich. Um, and uh, you've mentioned painful compromises, um, and I know that you refer to the six principles, but if you were to identify one on each side, the most painful compromise, and I think what you had mentioned before, uh, for example, were the occupied territories, but I think it's more of a bargaining chip uh, on the Armenian side. And say, for example, on the Azeri side, the similar bargaining chip is the economic opportunities that would open up for Armenia if it were to cooperate, etc. But if you were to dig deeper and to really look into the issues that are more emotional and less of you know, something that is less easy to give up, what would be one most significant uh, painful compromise that would you would identify on each side. Right. Um, okay. Well, I th I, th I think in um, I think that's a very a really good question, and I think in that sense the most painful compromise is to admit we did wrong, uh, we did bad. I think as you say in this country, um, and and that um, and clearly that has to come from both sides. But clearly, you know, this is a conflict, and my own I could. You know, no, no one behaves well in conflicts. I can, my, my own country, Britain, has behaved appallingly in all sorts of colonial conflicts around the world. So this is no criticism specifically of Armenians and Azerbaijanis saying they did some pretty horrible things to each other. And that, I think, has to be the most painful compromise is the moment in which we say, actually, we did some pretty bad, bad things to you. You did some pretty bad things to us. 
that clearly has to happen at the same time. I'm not, it would be naive to expect that to happen from one side before it happens to the other. I think that really is the most painful problem. Peace and reconciliation process of some kind. Well, I want to uh, thank both Rich for doing this and being a, a terrific <laughs> colleague to Tom and Tom for writing the book. Wayne Mary did remind us, uh, he preempted me, but I want to let everyone know the book is on sale at the back of the room.